Okay, so welcome to our Girls Petrol webinar, um, kindly organised by uh, Unikim and facil facilitated by uh, Big Net New South Wales. And I'd like to start by acknowledging and paying my respects to the Pambalong clan of the Awabakal people, um, the traditional owners and custodians of the land in which I'm currently sitting. Uh, and I'd also like to acknowledge and pay my respects uh, to all other traditional and sovereign owners and custodians on the lands where other people are meeting today, acknowledging that we've got a pretty good spread of people around New South Wales. Um, so probably don't need to give too much of a background to the Twitchathon uh, as an event, uh, but the Twitchathon has two main purposes. Uh, first of all, uh, the way I refer to it is that it's sport for bird, bird watchers. This is about as close as we get to sport. Um, it's a, a one time of the year where we have the opportunity to actually pit ourselves against each other and see who can find the most number of birds in a, uh, an allotted amount of time. Uh, but most importantly, uh, it's a fundraising event. Uh, and over the years, thanks, Steph. Uh, yeah, feel free to uh, let us all know um, uh, which country you're coming in from. Um, so over the years, we've raised money for, for various projects. And yeah, I mean, we, we would have had to have raised several hundred thousand dollars over the years. Uh, and a special mention for 2016, because that was uh, another year where we raised money for a very special bird that we're hearing about tonight, the Gould's Petrol. Uh, and with that money, we've, we've kicked some amazing goals and it's great to have Suze and, and Tom along tonight to hear Yuna's talk because they've been very heavily invested in the whole Gould's Petrol story uh, on the islands off Port Stephens. So in 2016, uh, we, we got funded uh, various works to happen on, on Broughton Island, not just for Gould's Petrels, but also white-based Storm Petrels, hoping to get that little guy back on uh, breeding on, on Broughton Island. Uh, but we've installed some nest boxes using that Twitchathon funding and, uh, and it's worked. So we've, yeah, we've had uh, Gould's Petrels uh, hatching chicks and, and fledging chicks uh, up on Pinkertop, which is just fantastic. So some, that's the, I guess that's uh, the context for uh, tonight's talk. So the 2021 uh, Twitchathon fundraising is going towards uh, Gould's Petrol Research to inform conservation actions on a fairly new island. Uh, it wasn't that long ago where really it was all down to one island, Cabin Island, but now uh, we have them breeding on four or five different islands. And, uh, there's a population on Montague Island, which which Yuna is researching, and so Yuna is going to give us a talk on Gould's petrels generally, but with a bit of a focus on what's happening down on Montague Island. So, so Yuna is a, uh, a a a passionate seabird ecologist. Uh, she's been devoted to the conservation program of Gould's petrels since 2009, <laughs> uh, when she. Uh, completed a, a PhD on the foraging ecology of Gould's petrels on, on cabbage tree. Um, and since then, she's been leading the Gould's petrel surveys on Montague Island. So uh, without further ado, I think I'll hand over to Yuna to, to go through tonight's talk. You are muted, Yuna. <laughs> <laughs> Hi everyone, <laughs> sorry. Uh, we, um, I'd like to share the video of Nicholas Carla. He uh, sent apologies, he really wanted to join us tonight, but yeah, he had uh, other yeah, commitment, so he couldn't join. So we will share the video of him and I will start the talk. Let me just, hopefully, uh, Sorry, I will just do it again with the share sound as well. Oh, what was the password, sorry? Oh. Uh, is everyone can see this video? Yeah. G'day, I'm Nicholas Carlo. I was first associated with Google Petrol in the early 1990s, 
but the work on this species started in earnest in 1989 when it was realized that the numbers were very low at a single breeding location and a lot was to be lost if something didn't happen soon to help protect this species. I spent 10 years working with Gould solidly and learned a lot about seabirds, which has really launched uh, many aspects of my career. But I always come back to Gould's petrel because they are an endearing and beautiful bird and still there is a lot of mystery around them. Yuna Kim, who's going to speak to you tonight, first got associated with the species a bit over a decade ago, starting her PhD, and she's never lost her love and her passion for this beautiful little bird. I hope that what we raise through the uh, involvement of the Twitchathon will really help us further the understanding of Gould's petrol, because as you'll see from tonight's talk, there are many things still missing and much to learn. I hope you enjoy it. Cheers. Okay, um, now I'm going to talk about Gould's petrol. Is everyone can see the PowerPoint? Yes. All about Gould's Petra now? Yes. 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 Okay. Okay, I will start. Thanks for joining us tonight. Um, I would like to give you an update uh, information on Gould's Petra. This species is quite famous among seabirds, you know, lovers. There have been so many publications and talks on this uh, bird as it has been actively researched for a few decades. I will try to summarize all information available till now, hopefully in 30 minutes, and to discuss why then this well-researched species still needs attention and we need to study further. Let's start with a quick introduction of Gould's Petrel. I think everyone actually joined tonight knows all this. It belongs to all the uh, Procellariformes with the other, you know, famous birds like albatrosses, shearwaters, and petrels. The Pterodroma leucoptera, the scientific name of Gould's petrel means actually white. So still the other common name, white-winged petrel, is used uh, worldwide. Gould's petrel is a globally threatened species. In a uh, red list category, it is uh, listed as vulnerable. The population size is estimated between 2,000 and 14,000, and it's decreasing. And a recent study suggested this species actually should be upgraded to endangered from vulnerable. So I will tell you why. First of all, a small breeding range. So only in New Caledonia, which is the uh, French territory in Pacific, and in Australia, you can uh, see Gould's petrel. And the subspecies, the Pterodroma leucoptera caledonica, is endemic to New Caledonia only. And within New Caledonia, there are only two breeding colonies. It is estimated uh, 5,000 to 7,000 breeding pairs. Uh, but uh, the low breeding success is really concerning. It's because of the uh, high, high level of predation of eggs, chicks, and others uh, by rats, pigs, and cats. So population is declining. So the, um, until the uh, active conservation measure, measures implemented in New Caledonia, the uh, maintaining Australian population is uh, very important. The Australian uh, Gould's petrel is Pterodroma leucoptera leucoptera, the another uh, subspecies. It is endangered nation, it is listed as endangered nationally and vulnerable in New South Wales. They again have limited breeding colonies, only found in New South Wales. So I will go through these four uh, key breeding colonies. In next slide, we will start with the cabbage tree island. This is the main breeding population. The colonies are concentrated on these two uh, gullies, and uh, the main vegetation is this cabbage tree uh, palms. And birds 
make nests between these uh, rock cavities. And the uh, palm prawns actually give some uh, protections from severe weather and also protect them from the avian predators. The uh, initial, initial findings on Cabbage Tree Island uh, between 1989 and 1992 was very worrying because um, the population was estimated less than 250 pairs and breeding success was really low, less than 20%, and only about 50 uh, fledglings per season um, it was produced and then mortality of adults were really um, high. So more than 50 individual births per season uh, was recorded. So definitely the population was unsustainable. So firstly, they identified, uh, identified the threat. Um, the rabbits were introduced to the island and basically grazing a whole uh, undercover. And that caused actually a secondary problem because the uh, sticky fruit from bird lime trees come all the way down to the ground. And when the birds um, come out from the nest, both adults and um, chicks, they became immobilized and starved to death. And then also the uh, predation by coral worms were high. So, Get, they had to eradicate the rabbits and kill some birds lime trees, although they were native. And then also native coralworms have been uh, culled to save this species from um, extinct. So around to, from 200 um, nestling pairs before uh, recovery plan, uh, it has been basically jumped up between like 800 and 1000 uh, nestling pairs. There were some sudden drops down to like 582 or 574 um, nesting pairs. That I will explain later. But yeah, basically at least this cabbage tree island population has been uh, stable until recently. But having a single breeding colony was quite risky because what if, you know, there's a, a bushfire, then, you know, the whole population could be wiped out. So they established um, a second colony uh, quite close to the uh, cabbage tree island uh, by translocating chicks. So they uh, made artificial nest boxes and move the chicks from Cabbage Tree Island to Bundeba Island. Fletching success was uh, very good uh, for two years. So in 1999, they translocated 100 birds and hand fed um, and 95 chicks basically uh, fledged. And then in 2000, there was 100% fledging success. So the uh, effort was quite, you know, like every day they've been basically feeding, feeding chicks by hand and, but you know, it paid off all the effort. So you can see uh, from here, from 1999 to uh, 2011, there were more immigration by adults and fledglings, but sort of stayed around between like 20 and 25 up until now. Uh, it's because there are some uh, competitions to certain nests. I don't know why, but there are like hundreds of United Fish Nest boxes available, but they tend to just take a few um, nests and other nests that are um, highly like competed. They obviously wouldn't uh, have, you know, viable eggs because they can get broken during the um, uh, fight. So, yeah. Or, the fledglings is uh, only about uh, between 20 and 25 so far. But at least the, uh, the cabbage tree island population is sustainable and uh, because they set up the secondary col second colony successfully, the New South Wales Scientific Committee downlisted the gold petrel from endangered to vulnerable in 2008 but it has been still listed as endangered nationally. 
Broughton Island and Little Broughton Island or, or Twitchton uh, fans probably know well because uh, in 2016, the uh, fund raised by uh, Twitchton committee basically used for Broughton Island and they could install a, a sound system to attract more birds to Broughton Island and in, uh, installed the nest boxes. And they had instant results next year in 2018. Um, they've seen the activity in the nest boxes and 2020, one uh, chick hatched. And also we did some survey in Little Broughton Island and found six natural nests in 2020. So all three islands, there, there have been active, you know, the conservation um, effort have been put for specifically for Gould's Petre. Um, but in Montague Island, the first discovery of Gould's Petre was very um, unexpected. Uh, Nicholas Carlyle actually was on Montague Island for other purpose. But then at nighttime, he heard Gould's Petre call. So next morning, he probably had a sleepless night. And next morning, he just ran around the island crazy and crazily and found the two um, gold petrels on Montague Island. So it took a bit of time. So after five years, we could uh, secure some funding and start Toro surveys from 2017s. We plan to uh, conduct two surveys during incubation period. As you may know, Gould's Petrel has about 50 days incubation period and both uh, male and females um, you know, the, uh, do the incubating. So we wanted to uh, intercept both parents if possible. So in November, we conducted one survey and then about two weeks, end of November, and then about two weeks later, like mid December, we conducted another survey. And then January survey was to see whether chick is um, uh, hatched so we can calculate incubation success. And then in March is to give the leg bands to uh, chicks before fledging. So hopefully we can calculate the breeding success per each season. But didn't really go well with <laughs> our plan because of the COVID, um, you know, uh, restrictions started kicked in and prevented us to go, uh, go to the island. And then there were also uh, bushfire threats. So I will show you. But first of all, the very interesting finding is actually these non-borrowing birds, um, they actually dig the nest on Montague Island. So all the gold spectral we found in Cabbage Tree Island, they use rock cavities or just hollows of tree trunks or very naive birds sometimes just to make a nest under the uh, fallen palm trees, the prawns. But we never found any birds actually making their own nest. But uh, on Montague Island, Majority of the nests were actually found under the um, near the tree, uh, basically the native uh, plant. This romandra, the common name is too long, so I just call romandra and then poa the uh, tussock grass. But do, these two native plants are basically used uh, for gold petrel in uh, Montague Island. So we. Um, the results indicate that even seemingly specialized seabirds can ad adapt their habitat use upon colonization of new islands and breed in aptic habitat. And another interesting discovery we made was Gould's petre that was banded as a chick in uh, Cabbage Tree Island was found in um, artificial nest box in Montague Island. So since we started um, survey in Montague Island, any uh, new birds basically we found, they never had any leg band. So we always had questions, 
where are they, you know, from? Are they from, you know, uh, New Caledonia? But we wouldn't be really able to answer that because there were no really active vending uh, program going on in New Caledonia. But then Cabbage Tree Island um, birds, at least, you know, chicks, they are uh, nearly all chicks were banded and banding program basically started from like 1992. So but we never found any cabbage tree island birds in Montague Island. So when I first opened the nest boxes, I was so surprised because actually the nest box was uh, installed in 2017, but the first birds in these artificial nest boxes was only found in 2000. Um, 21 January this year, basically. So for five years, there were no activity. So whenever I was opening the box, I actually re didn't really have much hope, but then there was a bird. So, oh, hello. But then when I lift, you know, the bird to check whether it has the leg, it, um, it has the band on the leg and it did have it. So I was really excited and then quickly like called Nicholas and asked to check the, his bending um, record. And it was bended in 2012. So we really don't know what happened for like last 18 years, whether this bird actually visited Cabbage Tree Island, but maybe just uh, because we didn't, you know, that mid, at a certain time, so we never discovered this bird before, or, you know, first time this bird is actually attempting to breed. So investigating, you know, potential, you know, his uh, uh, home, we don't know, but it was really uh, exciting. And next day when I went there, this bird actually left, but there was another unbanded bird was in the nest box. So hopefully uh, we will take um, first trip for this coming season in November, and maybe these two uh, make a home in this nest box. I'm not sure, but I, hopefully we can uh, update that. But what we uh, realized from this discovery is, you know, all these uh, birds known to go back to uh, their breeding sites, we call it like natal homing. So even, you know, these uh, uh, animals who have uh, natal homing may explore other uh, habitats if, you know, there's more favorable probably condition. So now we are going to look at the uh, number of nesting pairs of gold petrel breeding in Montague Island. But I'm going to present all these uh, numbers with the Cabbage Tree Island data because obviously like within Australia, we need to see bigger picture. And also this is just um, new, you know, uh, colony we discovered. So we want to see the uh, trends in both islands. So first season uh, in 2017, it, uh, we found about 31 uh, nesting, nesting pairs. And then next year it was jumped to 50. So like from two pairs in 2012 to like 31 pairs in 2017 and 18 season was already exciting, but it seems like, you know, population size is going up in Montague Island. But then in 2019 and 20, it was just dropped to 23 uh, nesting pairs. And then last summer, we found 21 nestling pairs. But in Cabbage Tree Island, um, it has been declining from 840 to 574 pairs in 2019 and 20 season. But the um, population has been jumped up um, at 844 uh, pairs. And the number of fledglings also increased slightly from 16 pairs in 2016, uh, uh, fledglings from 2017 and 18 season to 2018 and 19 season. 
But like I mentioned, because of the bushfire threat, we were not allowed to visit the island in 2019 and 20. So I couldn't get the data for this season. And then last summer, it was 16 uh, fledglings in Montague Island. And Caps Tree Island, uh, same as the uh, nestling pairs, the uh, number of fledglings have been decreased to 150, but it's recovered to 328. Breeding success in uh, Montague Island seemed to be higher than Cabbage Tree Island. It was 55.6% in 2017 and 18 season, and 53.8% uh, in 2018 and 19 season. We couldn't um, calculate the breeding success because we couldn't conduct the um, surveys in 2019 and 20 properly. But yeah, these two seasons were much higher than the Cabbage Tree Island breeding success. And it is really worrying that the uh, breeding success was down to 29.7% in Cabbage Tree Island in 2019 to 20 but it seems like uh, the uh, environment was more favorable in 2020 and 21. So breeding success was um, going up to 41.4% on Cabbage Tree Island. Then we have a question now, why you know, there are, uh, the, the breeding success in uh, Montague Island is higher um, than Cabbage Tree Island and then also why, you know, this uh, population size or breeding success has been declining in Cabbage Tree Island, although, you know, the conservation measures or effort on both islands remained the same for last decade. We need to actually find answers at sea where gold petra spend most time. So we um, collected all uh, SC observation data um, and mapped uh, these. Uh, so the, these individuals, um, you know, dots um, in uh, each, you know, observation. So as you can see, uh, it's very concentrated around Australia, Tasman Sea, but then there's also um, a lot of observation data collected from the uh, East Pacific. However, this um, CO, uh, SC distribution is not actually really showing the gold spectral real movement. It's more due to the uh, effort of the survey put. So there were more ship survey happening around the uh, East Pacific by American uh, ship. And then there's uh, quite a bit of um, survey happening between you know, Sydney and Antarctic uh, Sea, the Tasman Sea. That's why perhaps you know, there were more records. Um, but at least we could, uh, we could uh, sort of uh, divide these um, individual data uh, into the two groups. So breeding seasons uh, data and then non-breeding seasons data. Then uh, as we expected, around uh, during the breeding season um, near the east coast of Australia and around the Tasman Sea, there are more observation data recorded. So the non-breeding seasons, uh, we could uh, suspect these birds probably migrate to um, west coast of America. So rather than, you know, some birds could be just uh, dispersed uh, but this probably do migration, but we need uh, another limitation of this uh, SC observation data is we actually don't know whether all these observation uh, for uh, the Pterodroma leucoptera caledonica or it's Pterodroma leucoptera leucoptera because SC it's impossible basically to identify these two uh, subspecies. So we actually didn't know whether the birds breeding in Caledonica um, 
uh, more concentrated in the east coast of um, Australia, or it could be west coast of America, we really couldn't uh, verify that. So the way we could do is through the um, tracking, the, uh, using the geolocators, this basically record light levels. And when you integrate all this light level data with the time data, then you can uh, see the sunrise and sunset uh, time. And then with the day length, you can get the uh, longitudinal and latitudinal fixes. So we used the two types of uh, um, tracking data. Um, and one was uh, a little bit smaller than the other one because the other one was collecting uh, some additional data besides the light level or temperature. It could also um, give us the wet or dry conditions. So you could see whether they are either foraging at sea or resting at sea, or whether they actually landed um, on landed uh, for uh, incubation or uh, to feed the chicks. And then also it could uh, collect diving that uh, depth. So these are the uh, tracking data. So individual dots, dots are basically like individual location we could collect. And then we uh, did the corner density analysis. So basically the um, darker color means more uh, concentrated. So this is 25%. And then 50%, 75%, and then 95%. So this is the Pterodroma leucoptera, leucoptera, which is Australian birds during the non-breeding season. So this, uh, just to orient yourself, I circled like, um, sorry, uh, Cape Story Island, and then that's uh, Hawaii, and. Basically, they were really uh, spending a lot of time during number eating season below the Hawaii. And then this is the Caledonica. So I circled like New Caledonia on the left, and then Hawaii is on the top. So the, and then the right hand side, that's the um, Galapagos Island. And Caledonica is more concentrated on the um, east side of. The Pacific. Uh, you might notice the um, the sample size of uh, Caledonica is uh, much smaller because these tracking devices you only can uh, get the data after retrieving um, the devices. But New Caledonia birds uh, were not really researched, so we didn't really have a breeding history. So we basically had to. Uh, deploy the, uh, the tracking devices to any birds available. So return rate was uh, much lower, but the capture tree island, obviously we didn't want to lose our devices. So we specifically picked the good breeders so we can expect the birds, you know, return next season to get the data. So when you look these two, um, subspecies map together, then there's definitely segregation in the, uh, uh, during the non-breeding season. And uh, pre-breeding season, about like one month uh, before the uh, breeding uh, season starts, uh, Leucoptera, Leucoptera is uh, more concentrated around the east coast of Australia very close to the edges, but uh, Caledonica is more utilizing the uh, Tasman Sea. And uh, during the uh, breeding se season and then altogether non-breeding season, you can see um, they start, uh, they basically arrive, sorry, uh, around October to Cabbage Tree Island, and then they depart uh, around the 23 uh, April um, to uh, the non-breeding site. And Caledonica, they actually uh, start their migration a little bit later, 
so May around May, uh, they arrived to the non breeding site, and then they returned to the island um, around November. So there's about one month uh, differences in timing. So non breeding seasons um, like cold lo location is separated, and then timing wise, it is also segregated. And the round trip is basically 20,000 kilometers, which is very long, amazing. And I mentioned, you know, reason for higher breeding success, we probably need to find it as, um, at sea, because basically the um, foraging location during the breeding seasons, uh, this is actually the data uh, collected in 2011 and 12 from um, Capture Tree Island, but so far no one actually tracked Montague Island uh, good petra. So first time we would be able to track the uh, Montague Island birds through this Twitchstone uh, fund. So we don't know yet but we think they probably utilize the same uh, similar area during breeding season because they have a limitation basically. So during the incubation period, they need to come back to the land, um, the breeding site within sort of, you know, 15 days so they can relieve the um, partner who was uh, incubating without any, you know, eating and, if you know chick hatches, they basically forage like every night. So they have to return to their breeding site to feed uh, with the, this parental duty. So they wouldn't be able to go too far. But what we know is they utilize these um, east coast of Australia and uh, east side of Tasman Sea. And if uh, Montague Island breeders use the same area, they would basically take about 900 kilometers um, saving each foraging trip. So their body condition could be much, you know, better because they can just uh, um, save, you know, like travel shorter distance to the foraging site. That's why we are uh, would like to raise a fund and to track this Montague Island bird. But uh, this is just a broader um, the conservation actions that uh, we need to put for Gould's Petrel. Um, the continuous monitoring of all three population, basically the Montague Island and Caps Tree Island and even New Caledonia Island is really necessary. And uh, banding um, is really, some people think all oh, this, like they would like to use, you know, tracking devices and use fancy modeling, but banding uh, seem to be, you know, regarded as more like traditional old fashioned, but it gives a lot of information to us. So uh, we need to continue banding any birds during the monitoring and, the tracking, obviously, to identify the core foraging location of Montague Island is uh, required, but it would be more meaningful if we can track um, simultaneously of all three populations. So we could compare the, um, the movement at sea between the uh, colonies, but also because we already have like 10 years of or go uh, the collected data so we can uh, see whether any climate change have been impacted the uh, movement of goods petre. And obviously their movement at sea is uh, related to uh, their diet. So we need to study um, goods petre diet, perhaps through the regurgitation and analyzing the hard remains, but also we can um, uh, study the nutritional value because the previous studies already showed that Gould's petrel is very opportunistic uh, foragers. Their diet is very varied, but whether uh, there's any uh, differences be, uh, within the colony or between colonies. So we, if we can um, expand this diet to study to all uh, population would be good. 
and uh, the urgent um, you know, eradication of all uh, vertebrate pests mentioned in New Caledonia should be uh, started soon. Um, so with all this tracking data, we could um, suggest a marine important bird area for gold petrel. And as you expected, it's around the east coast of Australia, but uh, we could support with uh, more data from uh, gold petrel breeding in Montague Island. And sadly, the current IUCN um, categories in Australia network of marine protective area, as you can see, it's all gray area, basically there's no uh, MPA. Um, so hopefully with uh, more uh, tracking data, we can support and designate um, marine parks in the uh, east coast of Australia where these gold petrel and perhaps other small um, seabirds may utilize the same area. So I would like to give thanks to so many people actually, like David Pridel and Nicolas Carly. They have been dedicated for this um, species conservation for like 30 years. Um, you can see, you know, this young, you know, people now have like no hair or <laughs> very gray hair. Um, and yeah, it, Suze is uh, joining us today, like New South Wales, you know, National Park and Wildlife Service in Nelson Bay for, you know, Cabbage Tree Island and Broughton Island and uh, Bundeva Island. They have been put so much effort. And then after, you know, the discovery of Montague Island, the teams in Naroma has been actively yeah, helping us to conduct a survey. And there have been so many volunteers from so many bird observers club. Um, and many actually tour companies uh, helped us a lot while we, you know, seabird research can be just too expensive because we have to take the boat then, yeah, but when we don't have enough funding, they just gave us a free ride. So I must say thanks to Let's Go Adventure and Imaging Cruise in Nelson Bay and the Naruma Charters in Naruma. And I just cannot say thanks to, you know, like, I don't know, like so thankful that we 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 will get some funding for Montague Island bird through this um, Twitch tone. Um, thanks to all um, big net groups and to especially the uh, organizers. I think uh, nearly everyone here is actually from this uh, big net organizer. I really thank you. And I think maybe I will let um, Mick to explain this how to donate section. Mick, Mick? I, I, don't, I don't know if that's a good idea. Uh, I prefer offline donations. <laughs> but it's, it's as easy as going to that website, Razorly, where you can um, use a credit card. It's, it's, that, it's that simple to make a donation. Um, there's also other ways of donating. You can just make a direct deposit into the Big Net account. Um, and people like myself are collecting offline donations, doing it the old school way, um, just through our day-to-day -day contacts. Um, people, people know that the Twitchathon is happening. And I guess I've got to say, you know, to some extent, hats off to Big Net, uh, because we are the only state that's organising a Twitchathon no flood, fires, or global pandemic will stop New South Wales running a Twitchathon. Uh, so yeah, it's 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 fantastic that that's happening, and it's um, yeah, we've got a website there that that Yuna's, Yuna's showing. Uh, Yuna, did you want to talk to the? We're offering some incentives for for people to donate and the coloring books. Did you want to talk to those? Yes, so we decided to give away this seabird coloring books to any teams raising uh, 200 or uh, more through the uh, fundraising event. And then also we've got a sponsor, IRES to Australia. They said um, they would basically donate six IRES. This is like eye massager. 
So they would <laughs> make you have a, like eagle eyes, but hopefully, you know, like before maybe bird watching, you know, they can put it on <laughs> and have a good rest. Um, so yeah, basically three teams uh, who raise the most fund will get two of each, yeah, eye mask. Great. Um, and I think we're, I think we're floating around six thousand um, dollars pledged online, uh, and there's there's doubtless more sitting in the big net account. And I know for a fact that I've got about eight hundred dollars offline myself. So yeah, we're we're really hoping that we'll give 20, 20 grand a nudge um, to to help you know and and Gould's petrol. So yeah, fantastic. Um, are you done there? Uh, you know, are you happy to take some some questions? Yes. Uh, so Tom had a really good question because I was actually wondering a, a similar thing. Because uh, Tom's Tom Clark has been involved with the the Goulds Petrol surveys on cabbage trees. So he he has asked, are the estimates of numbers on both islands calculated by the same method? Now, Tom, do you mean when you say both, do you mean Cabbage tree and Montague, or do you mean uh, the New Caledonian population? If you can. Yes, um, uh, the thought uh, popped in my mind when the, um, <clears throat> when your unit was showing those uh, comparisons between Cabbage tree and Montague. Um, the Montague numbers are fairly low. I'm imagining that's like a they've counted every bird they've found um, on. Cabbage tree, there's a method where uh, you basically survey about 40% of the island um, each year, a different 40% each year, and there's some calculation, you, know, you extrapolate out to, uh, to figure out what your population is. So you're not actually counting every bird on cabbage tree. Yeah, so yeah, as you said, the um, cabbage tree island, they do transect survey. But um, Montague Island, it's quite uh, difficult to actually even make the transects. So yeah, you're right. We just basically walking along the bushes or you know along the uh, like cliff basically, where we think good petrel might you know uh, have a nest. So we we walk around like mimicking their calls. And if any bird respond to us, then we will, you know, give the nest markers. And if the bird can be reachable, then we give the band. So it's more like the survey is done in Little Broughton Island or Broughton Island. So the survey methods are different between these two islands. So yeah, there's a, you know, chance that maybe, yeah, we are not perfect, so we, we miss out the bird. So initially we were just calling and walking around, but I actually noticed some uh, birds just they don't respond to us. If it's, you know, during the incubation period, they are really in the deep sleep. Then, you know, sometimes you probably notice the some birds, even if you pick them up, yes. They just are still, you know, sleeping. They are not going to respond to our call. So we've been looking really thoroughly uh, between the rock cavity or any um, uh, potential nest, you know, just putting our hands in and try to really call loudly, you know, at the entrance of the uh, potential nest. So, yeah, it's it's different between yeah these two islands. You know, is yeah. um, <clears throat> on the uh, Montague Island, yeah. um, do you consider like a, a discrete area, a certain area as being the breeding area there or are you looking all over the island? No, so basically the uh, island is quite flat and oh, I should actually explain better. So North Island is basically where we are uh, focus on but not whole island because uh, basically the uh the main like part are dominated by shear waters so we only uh survey on the uh, west side of uh, close to the edges of the island where there are more rocks 
and then also east side uh, of the uh, North Island. And then in South Island, there's a lighthouse. It's very different settings, you know, Cabbage Tree Island, there's no, you know, uh, other facility except the little igloo and the kitchen, but uh, Montague Island, the South Island, basically visitors, you know, walk around everywhere. And there are three lighthouse cottages. So, but we still do find um, nests along the east side of North Island. So, I mean, South Island. So <laughs> it's a, yeah, North East side of South Island of Montague Island, I should say. We do have some nest, but that's also near the cliff. So, yeah, we only uh, focus on three areas to find birds. Thanks, Yuna. I've, I've got a couple more questions, but um, I'm happy for someone else to have a, have a go. Oh, well, Tom, well, you got the floor. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> okay. Right, so I've, ever since um, we started talking, about I think it's probably at least a year ago, maybe two. Um, the birds were being found um, in the base of Lamander and Poa. Um, we were, were wondering then if that's happening on Montague Island. There's plenty of other islands with these plants, like Cabbage Tree and uh, Boonalbar. Um, the thought was. We only search in the two gullies on uh, cabbage tree. Is it worthwhile anyone considering searching these more open areas where the uh, that that other habitat exists? And and has that been done? And do you think it's a good idea? I think it's a good idea um, because uh, I see you know unbanded birds in Montague Island. And I believe these are from either Capsule Tree Island or from New Caledonia. So, uh, but you know, like I mentioned, Capsule Tree Island, but they, um, they are mostly bended only along the, um, you know, the, the two galleys. So uh, probably unbanded birds in the um, cliff side or more like a, yeah, other mm. sites where we don't do the transect survey, probably, yeah, they are coming from there because, but then, you know, these uh, natural nests, if they dig the nest, but it will be, you know, overtaken easily by shear waters. Um, so maybe they see as, you know, that habitat is not really suitable. So they try to find, you know, other, mm. Um, site, I really don't know, but yeah, I think it's worth, you know, putting some effort and I think Nicholas have been actually just, yeah, wandering around when he's on the uh, Cabbage Tree Island, not just, you know, focusing on this um, two gullies. He's been walking around and try to find some few nests, but I think he hasn't, not in the, um, you know, under the, the Poa or Romandra for sure. Um, <clears throat> it makes perfect sense that birds are trying to colonise uh, Montague Island and be closer to the prey species during their breeding. Um, like I say, you know, they've, they've got that, what was it, 800 kilometres head start. Yeah. <clears throat> um, what do we know about the actual prey species um, and where it occurs in the oceans? Um, so I have a list, at least 11 families, I think, yeah, more than 10 families basically of uh, squid uh, were found. And also there were three, I think, fish species were, uh, I should say like family rather than species because this was basically identified through the otolith of fish or squid we analyzed the um, uh, the uh, beaks, squid beaks. So it's difficult to actually uh, identify by the species level, 
but it was really varied. So, and also between the season 2011 and 2012, the uh, hard part remain obviously is a bit limited because all other uh, soft part could be just digested and unable to identify. So um, this study has a bit limitation, but still um, the variation between the percentage basically between fish and squid were changing um, uh, within the same season, like by January, uh, February and uh, uh, March. So during the same breeding season, there were some differences. And then also there were differences between the uh, two years. So, but what we know is it's very varied. So they are opportunistic uh, feeder and these uh, beaks are really small. So, you know, gold spatula probably wouldn't be able to dive too deep. So um, they basically wait uh, all these uh, young, you know, the um, squid or fish comes to the surface uh, at nighttime. Then maybe they forage at uh, night. That's what we could uh, um, uh, imply through our diet study, but yeah, we. I would like to do when I when I do the tracking study. Study. I really want to include the diet study. Like I mentioned, the movement is directly, you know, related to the foraging species. So we really need to do further study on the diet of all these three uh, populations. So I, I don't think I answered very well, like you probably wanted to know like each, you know, species, but I, I no, cannot no, really no. recall. But yeah, there were at least 16 families were yeah, included in the diet of Gould's Petre. I, um, yeah, I have a related, related question, but I think I'll, I'll, I'll flick to a question that Emily has asked in the chat. Um, it's also... I'm sure that I've asked uh, Nicholas this, or other people this question as well. But she said, uh, not sure if these are the same, but I have a question about geolocators. To avoid loss of the tags, as the tags have to be retrieved from birds, would you consider using satellite transmitters uh, which show real-time data? Or maybe this is too expensive and the tags still need to be retrieved. So in short, why, why not use satellite transmitters instead of the geolocators? The short answer is because it's too heavy for these small birds. Mm -hmm. So basically these uh, satellite tags to send the uh, real time data, they need you know, the, the big battery. But yeah, these uh, small birds cannot carry so much weight. So we had to choose geolocators. I think there are now, the, the technology is there that they are lighter, um, but I suspect they're very expensive. That's right. Uh, yeah, we, we actually have a small number of satellite transmitters that will fit on a Regent Honey Eater, but they're, you don't want to know how much they cost. <laughs> <laughs> they're very expensive. So to be, to be putting them on seabirds that are flying around the ocean, uh, yeah, I think it might be a bit of a, a, bit of a risk management. Thing, yeah. It's a good question though. I'm, I'm assuming that it won't be too long until these satellite transmitters are, are more readily available, um, the way that technology is going. Um, yeah. Yeah, even um, geolocators, when I um, used it in 2011 and 12, that was the lightest one we could get, like two gram or 2.5 gram. But now there's like one point one gram, one point five gram uh, geolocators available, so we could actually track white-faced stone petrel yeah. with it. So yeah, I think uh, yeah, more yeah, as time pass, we we'll probably get cheaper satellite, <laughs> that cheaper and light yeah satellite yeah. transmitters, and hopefully we can use it for good petrel as yeah. well. I can see Kathy's raised her hand. Uh, just a couple of questions. Um, so it looks like the girls' petrels 
been prepared to move south to Montague Island and try and breed there. Do you think there's other islands further down the coast towards Victoria that that potentially they could try and um, uh, breed on if if um, that's um, closer to their breeding um, their feeding areas? Yeah, I I thought so too. Um, and you know that uh, at sea observation data, then you know there are some uh, uh, records around the, even Antarctica as well. Um, although they probably be the um, non-breeders uh, movement, but yeah, I do think it, it could be, if it's not now, maybe in, I don't know, another 10 years time, we might see groups patrol in yeah, Victoria as well. So that's why I think um, uh, we always, um, you know, not just in New South Wales, like uh, collaborate collaborate with you know other states would be really important and also with the uh, New Caledonia population it's really further up um, but yeah they they really have a lot of problems on the breeding site so potentially um, all the birds basically could uh, do you know sort of migration so we really need to work you know in an international le level I guess. Uh, you know, um, do you know much about the breeding areas in New Caledonia? Um, are uh, they breeding on offshore islands as they do here, or um, is it the same sort of habitat um, or on the mainland in the mountains? Um, yeah, so I, I know they are in the uh, south uh, east, south part or the more like a center of the uh, New Caledonia, the main one. Um, yeah, and uh, basically it's in the main island. They have uh, like resort. So not just, you know, these pests, they also have some light pollution um, is, you know, one of the reason for the uh, gold spectral threats in this New Caledonia. Um, the habitat is uh, very close to the um, cliff so where the uh, pigs or, you know, rats cannot easily uh, have access to, but th that's because probably only, you know, those um, cliff, uh, the nests are not very accessible, yeah. remained till now um, because of the habitat uh, disruption by other pests. But so yeah. It's on the main, uh, main, main, main island, island rather yeah. than offshore islands. And yeah, there is a paper about New Caledonia Gould's Petra. It's written by Nicholas, David Pridel and Nicholas and other um, French colleagues. And they do yeah, specify these two colonies basically in the center and the south part of the uh, New Caledonia in mainland. And they suspect another offshore island, but yeah, it's just a suspect there, there was no finding yet. Okay. Thank you. It's a very interesting um, presentation. Yeah. Thank you. Hill? Yes, um, we're getting uh, on in time, I guess. So I love it very quick. A couple of comments and questions to you and I. Hello, by the way, you. this is the first time we met face to face, even though we work together. Yeah. <laughs> um, on Montego Island, uh, when I worked on, well, I worked off offshore islands in New South Wales for Parks and Wildlife Service on seabirds in 1988 and 1989. And uh, took uh, a few people to uh, Cabbage Tree Islands to, uh, originally we looked there to get rid of rabbits with CSRO. And that's my first involvement. Then uh, Dave Pradell came out with us as well and the, the rest of that's history. But going to Montague Island, uh, there used to be a big problem with um, shearwaters and um, uh, penguins getting caught up in kaikuya grass. Mm. I believe that, that most of that kaikuya grass has been removed, yes. as well as the big project removing rats and mice from the island. And I think that's probably uh, making it more um, suitable now for, for gorse petrol. So you don't know. I think that, I know they did the uh, aerial baiting for rats and mice on Montague. Yeah, but, uh, I missed your question. 
Yeah, but also the, 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 the Kakuya grass has a very long strands yeah. and the shearwaters and uh, um, the other ground nesting birds such as the um, penguin used to get caught in this around their wings and used to die from this. Uh, but I think there was a Parks and Wildlife did a lot of removal of the Kaikuya grass to make it uh, more suitable for, for ground nesting birds. Um, it may not know that's before your time, probably. Oh, so, yeah, we, we knew that they, it's actually ongoing, so all this bush regeneration. But I think they found it very difficult. Uh, they've been spraying actually to kill this kakuya grass during, um, you know, non, uh, basically like winter time. Uh, but I actually found one nest under the kakuya grass, um, you know, one nest of gold petre. <laughs> yeah. Um, under the kakuya grass uh, by accident because we didn't think, you know, gold petrel would make the nest uh, under <laughs> there. So when we actually, uh, you know, find the patches of this uh, kakuya grass, we actually just walk with uh, probably less care. <laughs> but then one of our, uh, our um, volunteers stepped on gold petrel nest. So, yeah, we found the nest. So uh, I think it, all these uh, gold petrel basically found in Montague Island are fairly young uh, breeders. So they really don't know where would be the best, you know, uh, nest. Probably rock cavity is the best, to be honest. The, the smallest, you know, entrance where they can just fit, but then have enough room in the end, perhaps. But then, yeah, they, they just need a probably a bit of time but yeah I know that there's an ongoing um, uh, like bush regeneration going on focusing on removing this cochlea grass and there are a lot of other weeds basically um, causing a bit of a problem like morning glories for example basically like covered on the top of you know all the lamendra um, where the shear water breeds so they have been trying to remove it, but it seems like South Island has a more uh, problem, but luckily the uh, gold petrel at least are uh, more in the uh, North Island where the uh, public access is prohibited. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm mindful that it is quarter past eight, but that um, doesn't, seem to matter <laughs> um it's great great discussion I, I just had a quick question which is kind of related to i think the point that kathy maybe tom were alluding to um just in the the, the changes that we're seeing like to me it's fascinating that within a few years we're seeing a seabird colonize an island closer to their breeding to, to their feeding grounds it's it makes you wonder well why didn't they do that before mm. uh, like is there has this happened elsewhere? Is there a precedent where, where something like this has happened? I, and I know that the islands becoming pest free definitely plays a part, um, but I don't think there's any historical evidence of them being on, on Montague. I'm, yeah, I'm just, yeah, it's thinking big picture. It's, it's really fascinating. I'm just wondering if, if you're aware of this having happened elsewhere. No, I don't know. Yeah, so I'm also very surprised. And then we actually took the uh, sound systems off from the uh, Montague Island to put um, put that you know sound system to further south. I think it's Cabo Island. Is Cabo Island further south? Isn't yes. it? Yeah. yeah. So Nicholas basically. Um, took that sound system off in 2020, end of 2020 season. Uh, so last summer, yeah, there was no sound system in um, Montague Island. Um, so yeah, I think he wants to put that into Cable Island to see whether it could attract more birds even further south, but I, I guess they need to do proper survey before they actually install the sound system there so they can compare 
at least, yeah, before yeah. sound system and after sound system, you know, the... If I've, the if I've read those maps correctly, is it true that the New Caledonian birds actually go further south and, and west than the Leucoptera birds? So those birds are actually traveling vastly longer distances than the Australian birds to forage. Is that right? Yeah, so I think it's because, uh, you know, the colder water are uh, known to be more productive. Yeah. So if they can get, I think, a good uh, wind, probably, yeah, it's better for them to forage, you know, in the Southern Ocean mm -hmm. and then go back to their um, breeding colony. But that's only possible, I think, during the, you know, the pre-breeding season and during um, incubation period, when they have a chicks to feed basically every night, I don't think they will come all the way down south, but we don't have a breeding seasons uh, data of uh, New Caledonia birds. So that's why I want to track these uh, three population at the same time to compare their movement at sea. Yeah. Yeah, I just think it's 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 fascinating, but yeah, like why wouldn't I have done it sooner? I guess. <laughs> I I mean, I guess that's what Tom was getting at. Perhaps is changes in their um, what they're foraging on might affect where they're breeding. Um, that's why it's really useful to know what they're what they're feeding on. Yeah. Um, Tom, did you have another question? I know that, uh, sorry, just back on the satellite tags thing. I know that well, Tom did put in the chat that satellite tags have been put, put on spoon-billed sandpipers, which are mm -hmm. um, quite a bit smaller than Gould's petrels, but they're only meant to transmit for a short period to cover the migration. So um, maybe the distances of these birds and the length of time that you'd need to have one on a bird would be an issue for Gould's petrels, I don't know. So I think the best way to do is using the satellite tags during the uh, breeding season uh, when they do just a short, you know, foraging trips. Yeah. But then using geolocators is more for, you know, study the migration patterns yeah. and to cover the non-breeding season's movement. Mm -hmm. Tom, did you well, a lot of actually researchers uh, mix these uh, two technologies. But we just uh, couldn't do that in 2000, you know, 10, 11, 12, because it wasn't uh, that advanced at the time. But a lot of recent studies, they use both like satellite tags and geolocators, even on the same bird, they do that. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yuna, do you have any um, thoughts about why the breeding success and numbers were so low was it in 2019 oh well water temperature and food availability or some yeah yeah. yeah so uh it was really uh hot years so um they said the testament Tasman heat waves basically hit on uh, in that year. So, so we think uh, the reason for you know the uh, low breed, low breeding success and um, the the uh, number of you know breeding pairs was so low in 2019 and 20 season is the uh, due to heat waves would have been good if we if we were you know tracking but basically you know. <laughs> from that time and then next year. So we have a certain event to you know, uh, compare, but yeah, there were other papers. I presented this basically at um, World Seabird Conference and a lot of New Zealand researcher was yeah, blaming for these heat waves in um, yeah, West uh, Pacific Ocean. 
Do you think the birds just decided not to even try to breed because of the weather conditions or did yeah. they begin breeding or, and abandon the nests? Or? Yeah, I think so. A lot of animals, you know, uh, basically when the environment is not favourable, they, you know, just skip the um, uh, breeding, although it's uh, known to be like annual breeders. Mm-hmm. Anyway, like, uh, and I think it's uh, probably more, um, you know, like Gulch Petrel, for example, they they known to live for a long, uh, long time. So these birds probably can sort of predict, you know, the um, the, the basically consequences. They know uh, the environment is not very favorable. No point, you know, even attempt. So they might not even return to the. Um, island to breed for that season. But um, I personally also thought it could be the uh, bushfire. You know, that we had really, really bad um, summer in in Mm -hmm. that year. And basically, whole East Coast was burning and where the, um, you know, Gould's Petrel breeding on cabbage tree island, they really forage close to the east coast of Australia. And that was uh, covered by bushfire ashes. And these uh, gulch petrel are surface breeders. So I thought uh, it should have, you know, affected their foraging performance. But then I heard there was uh, another severe bushfire in, oh, I forgot the years. But um, yeah, that that year, let's say, let's just make up, up let's say it was 2000, for example. Then when we see actually the um, data in 2000, they actually were fine. So my, you know, like sus- um, suspect or, you know, assumption, for, uh, maybe, you know, bushfire attributed to um, this low breeding success had to be, yeah gone so I think it's uh, basically due to the heat waves but again like gold petrel are really opportunistic uh, foragers so they could somehow you know like compensate in other way but yeah it, it's been decreasing more like you know gradually if you're looking at the um, cabbage tree island not just like one year suddenly dropped so maybe birds can tolerate, you know, this hot summers, like basically hot, um, the warmer, you know, the uh, sea surface temperature, but then decide not to, yeah, breathe and skip on that year. But then if we, we changed to more wet season, you know, last summer, so the uh, breathing performance was better, be- so it could be really like, you know, that between El Nina and La Nina yeah. impact. Well, yeah, there was the, 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 the flooding rains that happened around about the time that they would have been fledging um, earlier this year too. Yeah. And that April superstorm a few years ago um, had a bit of an impact on the habitat from memory. Um, that's right, Mick. Um, and um, last season, um, <clears throat> the the rainforest is still recovering from that that bash up that they got. Yeah. Um, the um, the last season counts though were much higher than the the previous, and the, um, I remember the the previous one to that um, we we're finding a lot of dead birds in the, on the floor. Um, hard to know um, what was happening there. There yeah. was uh, more predation going on, and last year we still had we still had ravens on the island. Um, I'm not sure if anything's been done about that. Yeah. It's very it's very hard to knock them over though. Yeah. Sue's isn't here anymore. <laughs> All right, um, we are pushing 8.30, um, but there's been some great uh, discussion um, since the end of the talk. Uh, if, if anyone's got one last burning question, 
Just one oh, comment, right. um, one comment um, Mick, um, regarding satellite transmitters, don't forget transatlantic, sorry, satellite transmitters are mounted on the back of the bird. Yeah. Now, a small diving bird such as this mm. would have a, a bigger resistance than the, the um, geolocators. Yeah. Um, the most successful um, Godwit, uh, E7, they actually uh, planted the uh, satellite transmitter in the abdominal cavity of the bird, and she's still got it now. <laughs> but anyway, um, that could be one problem there. Yeah. But okay, well, I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks, Phil. Good context. All right. Rounding out almost at 8.30. So thanks very much, Yuna. Um, Thank you. And it's, yeah, the ball's in our court to try and rabble rouse our sponsors and friends and contacts to, to donate uh, to the Twitchathon. Uh, like I keep saying to people, it's, it's an unusual year. Uh, the way that people are racing, including my own team, is not business as usual, but it very much is business as usual as far as fundraising is concerned. So, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, let's, let's keep those dollars rolling in. So it's, it'd be great uh, now that we've got this talk uh, that we can, we can post on the website and make available on the Facebook page too for, for people to get get a bit of a background to, to why this is such important work. So thanks, Yuna. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yep. Thank you. I'll stop recording there.